If you look around, you'll see the beauty of God's creation. Wonderful gift to us today. Um, today, we're going to celebrate his creation and made here, but also we're going to celebrate the life of a very special person. Um, I wonder, and I, I asked somebody, what, what comes to your mind? Maybe a phrase or a word when you think of Doris. And they told me. And I just had to remember a conversation with Shar Domes just uh, the other day when we talked about um, how Doris lived. And I think about how she dressed. It was impeccable. Um, each day she would clothe herself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And then she'd also add a garment called forgiveness. Somebody told me today that she's just such a forgiving person. And then putting on the, the larger overgarment of, of love, Colossians chapter 3. That's how she dressed. I wonder what comes to your mind when you think of her today. Um, we have many memories to share today. There is going to be an open mic at one point, and uh, there are some people who are going to share, and then you will have an opportunity, if you'd like, to talk about a memory uh, of Doris in your own life um, for like a minute or two, and uh, and we'd love to hear from you. So just announcing that ahead of time so you can think about it. Um, today, we, we're going to look at the life of Doris. We'll see that she had an open home, a resilient life, and a loving heart. And um, so glad you've come this afternoon. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to just invite God's presence in a felt way to be here. Would you bow with me? Father, a, uh, there are times when we'll not have words to express what's on our heart, um, but we want to direct um, a heart that's overflowing with thanksgiving for this life that you've given Doris. Thank you, Father, for the impact that she's had on all of us. Um, in this day, we reminisce a little bit and think about her 90th birthday. Uh, so many people came out to celebrate that day with her. Today, we're celebrating um, her home going. Help us to do that, Father, in an appropriate way. And may Jesus be exalted. And may you be praised and worshiped in a very precious way today, Father. Thank you for this time. Lead us forward in Jesus' name. Amen. One way to go forward right now would be to sing a hymn that uh, was very precious to Doris, and uh, Larry is going to come and help us to do that. Larry asked me to be the helper and the paper holder. So that's why I'm up here. I'll make sure that I hold it right for you. And uh, Mark, Mark found in some of Doris's writings two hymns that had stars beside them. Blessed Insurance was one of them. And Diane and I and others actually picked up prior to learning that. So it's provident that we're singing what she selected. So blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
mind. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, turn of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. like to read a collection of scripture passages as we remember Doris, Grandma to some of us, as we celebrate her life, as we grieve, as we face difficult and weighty thoughts, we do well to keep the word of God before us, the enduring, the inspired word of truth. So first, a word of comfort from 2 Corinthians 1. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father, the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. As well, from Psalm 139. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. As well, a word of salvation, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And finally, a word of eternal hope. John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. First Corinthians 2. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is if you come up here, if you introduce yourself, 
and uh, that way we didn't. Uh, that's that was Jordan Domes, uh, my brother Lyndon's son. Uh, I'm Mark Domes, not why you're all here today. I know, but uh, um, I. Uh, I, I get to, uh, to uh, do the eulogy for mom. We wanna thank you guys for coming. We wanna thank all the online people as, as well for, uh, for tuning in. I, we hope you can hear us here. I may not make it. She loved the acreage, she loved the fall colors and the harvest time. She'd love to share this day with you too. On behalf of my brothers and sisters, I'd like to say a special hello to Aunt Darlene Tillman and Uncle Ray Shire. Uh, if they're watching by video, we hope they are. And as well, a special welcome to Uncle Don who was helping with the singing and, uh, and Aunt Darlene, um, mom's brother and sister-in-law. Um, you may have read the, the eulogy in the handouts and all, already and wondered about some of the details of mom's story. There's so much more. I'd like to give you just a few small snippets of, of uh, detail in that. I want to apologize in, in advance for errors or omissions or because my siblings won't remember it the same as I do, but I am the correct version. <laughs> We know each of you has some story or memory. That's why you're here. We'd love to hear them in, in uh, the open mic time if you're, if you're available. Doris Louise Shire Domes was born on the family farm near Lemberg, Saskatchewan, August 17th, 1928. She was the third of, of nine children. There was three girls and six boys in total, born to Samuel and Helena Shire. At age 12, Doris was exposed to Christian radio programming and accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. Helena Shire came from a Baptist background. Her father was a lay preacher and Grandma Shire was a big influence on her children's spiritual journeys. Accordingly, radio broadcasts were chosen carefully as limited battery life for the radio was precious and only used sparingly. Christian, bro Christian broadcasts were a staple. Doris worked hard on the farm. As one of the older siblings, mom would worked like a hired hand when needed, especially during harvest, and regularly as a caregiver to the younger children, while Grandma Shire attended to other chores as a self-sufficient farm required. There was lots of work to be done. Doris attended the one-room peace school for grades one to eight, like brothers and sisters before and after her, and then went there as well to complete correspondence for grade nine and 10. She then lived as a housekeeper during her high school years out of necessity to be able to afford high school. In grade 11, she boarded with and worked for a family in Lemberg who had a new baby. This was an especially hard year in cooking, getting wood, house cleaning, babysitting, and as there was no indoor plumbing, so she was responsible for emptying the chamber pots and washing dirty diapers by hand too. They were not disposable. After high school, she attended Christian Training Institute, CTI, in Edmonton. That, that is not, that's a friendly squirrel, that one. Um, CTI was later known as NABC, or North American Baptist Conference, which later became Taylor College and Seminary. Uh, she then went on to normal school, or teacher's college, in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Mom would usually add teacher's college after saying normal school, and added the caveat, so my kids. From 1949 to 1951, Doris taught grades one through eight and nine, 10 by correspondence in one room schoolhouses in Saskatchewan, not too far from where she was raised. A one room schoolhouse was typically built in the corner of a section of land, not near any towns or cities. These places had the school room as well as small living quarters for the teacher. Generally, they're not equipped with any extras like running water or automatic central heating. The teacher was responsible to make it viable. I'm guessing that a lot of the teachers for these schools came from farming backgrounds like mom and had the skills to be self-sufficient. Her first year was in a school called Kenningsburg near Fenwood, 
Saskatchewan. The second year was at Tullymet near Belcarra, cleaning floors, keeping the wood stove stoked, and making great friendships with students and local people. Years later, when we were living back in that area, I was able to meet some of her former students, now established farmers themselves, and they had very fond memories of her short time there. At some point in those two, two years, mom bought a set of wherever pots, a practical purchase, no doubt. One of them I see is propping up, uh, propping up a picture there, but I brought that because I wanted to, uh, uh, remind my kids that there are things that are older than me. Those pots are 70 years old. And if you've ever had a meal at my mom's, some of it was probably cooked in those pots. She married El Elmer John Domes on August 1st, 1951. Uh, the wedding was at the Shire family farm near Lemberg and was outside behind the house there. I remember seeing pictures of the wedding and and uh and noticed that the the evergreens beside the house were maybe 10 feet tall um the last time i was at the farm those trees are over 40 feet tall um it's it's a it's an interesting contrast brothers and sisters were favored attendants and still are for lots of weddings and i believe aunt darlene tillman was mum's maid of honor i got the nod from char so that's a fact then <laughs> they first lived in Gimli, Manitoba, where Lyndon was born. Dad was in the Air Force and had a number of different postings in Western Canada. In their time at Gimli, Gimli they built a small cottage at Winnipeg Beach and lived there. With a new baby in tow, they were posted to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Following a move to Moose Jaw, they welcomed Errol, Colin, Charlene, Diane, and Mark. Lyndon, Errol, and Colin are all one year apart. So it was a busy time for mom. Charlene was born two years later in 1957, Diane in 1959 and myself in 1961. Six kids in eight years, she was busy. Elmer's career in the RCAF then, then took Doris and the family many places, including Saskatoon, Red Deer and, and uh, Edmonton. Mom remembered the idealness of being in Red Deer, which allowed them to go to the mountains for camping and fishing and enjoy the scenery and family times. We were often packed into a station wagon for camping, picnics and weekend trips. And looking back, none of us understand how they fit everything in there. Elmer retired from the Air Force in 1971 and the older boys were getting ready to move out on their own. We were on the move once again. Leaving Edmonton in 1973, Doris and Elmer, with the youngest and brightest three kids, moved, moved briefly to Creston, BC, and then spent a year in Lethbridge, Alberta, before moving to a farm near Melville. Those youngest three bright, brightest kids are apparently the ones to conspire on this writing and approve the adjectives used. Let's talk to farm near Melville in uh, 1974. Uh, she did have a lot of fond memories of that, but it was not all fondness. Not all of the aspects of the pine telephone, no running water. That meant no indoor toilet. There was an only, only an oil burning stove in the middle of the house on the main level. And Charlene and Diane shared a bedroom on the back end of the upstairs level where the heat refused to go. They piled on blankets for warmth. They got dressed under the blankets in the morning. So they were warm before they got up. Uh, through those times, mom outsourced her former chamber pot emptying chore to me. We had a five gallon pail in the front sun porch in a fancy outhouse like shell surrounded by some old stood up picnic tables that needed to be emptied and more often was better than not. This was a far cry from the convenience she had, conveniences she had enjoyed previously and was very discouraging at times, but she made the best of it. That's how she approached every challenge and setback. She embraced the opportunity to keep chickens and ducks and geese and grow a big garden. She tried beekeeping and continued with sewing and quilting and numerous other ventures. She was a bus driver for a while I rode the bus with her, I was well-behaved. 
And uh, she worked in an upholstery shop with a couple of our nieces in Fenwood, Saskatchewan. She wasn't afraid to try new things and she loved those encounters. She was also closer to her family who lived in the area. And we often saw her parents, grandpa and grandma Shire, and that was fantastic. Retirement found Doris and Elmer moving back to Salmon Arm or moving to Salmon Arm, BC in 1980, where they used mom's skills as a seamstress and dad's abilities, handyman abilities to do upholstery. Her time in BC was bittersweet. Mom loved the Okanagan and reveled in all the fruit and vegetables that were so readily available. And she appreciated the warmer climate after so many years on the prairies. She loved having the children and grandchildren visit there. Doris and Elmer divorced in 1986 and she moved back to Alberta near to where the children had settled. Doris was able to work and travel and enjoy watching her children and grandchildren and eventually great grandchildren grow. She thrived here. She loved the garden. She loved to sew and do needlework and quilt. She was always an excellent cook and could make a gourmet out of whatever she had on hand. Our kids joke that she could make seven course meal out of freezer frost. A skill no doubt learned from raising six growing children on a, on a limited budget. A lot of you knew my mom through this time and experienced firsthand her adventurous spirit her hospitality and can-do approach to everything she tried. Doris lived in her small home in Clareview until 2012 when she moved into Emmanuel home in Edmonton. She loved her many friends and the, and the care she received there. Just this summer, it was evident that Doris needed to relocate to a long-term care facility, a move that was difficult for her, but she was always grateful for the help and care she received and the many who came to visit her and bring goodies and grandkids to the new location. Mom was able and adventurous enough to want to make it to Hanmore Lake for her 93rd birthday this summer in August. It's our annual celebration for her birthday. And she made it, she came out. We all had a great day. And watching her laugh and greet people and clap in joy for her grandchildren. I did this in practice too. And great grandchildren and to hold babies and to reach out and touch us in love, blessed everyone. Mom passed away peacefully in her room, surrounded by family. She will be greatly missed by all who had the privilege of knowing and loving her. Thank you guys for coming uh, today. We're gonna have uh, some tributes now from the children. Char will go first. Char is the only one that understands the order. Follow her lead. I got my back up. I, I brought that, but I see there's a whole box here, so. <laughs> Doris Louise Domes was her, were her given names. Not very many people called her by those names. Um, Aunt Doris, for sure. I called her mom. Many, many called her grandma. Uh, some of them were Domes wannabes. Uh, Gramsies, Grams and even Queen Bee. Dear family and friends, thank you so much for loving my mom and being such an important part of her life. Uh, thank you for continuing to show that love today by sharing this time with us, either in person here in this beautiful setting or virtually as we honor her life and the legacy that she's left behind in our hearts. <clears throat> Thank you for all the prayers, the warm, kind messages and emails, delicious meals, beautiful flowers, sharing your memories. Thank you for crying and laughing and often at the same time with us. You've been such an encouragement. 
I had the joy and privilege of spending lots of time with my mom. And it was really, really hard choosing just a few memories to share today. Today, you're going to hear, hopefully, from a number of people that will add their memories to mine, which I'm sure are going to make you smile and nod as they resonate with the memories that you have. Um, I want to read Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14 from the message. Um, Pastor Dan uh, was attending the Fort Alliance Church a number of years ago, and, and he was using this uh, in a Mother's Day service and, and asked a few of us if we could speak to a, a character trait um, regarding our mom. And so I was one of the, the people chosen. And I remember uh, thinking, I can't do just one, one of these. Um, so as I read, I just want you to think, and Pastor Dan has already mentioned some of them, um, what, what your memory is. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And what, regardless of what you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. And just like all those years ago, I think I could share examples of each of those traits. Mom cared deeply for people. She was always kind and humble, disciplined. And I saw many examples of her quiet and incredible strength through the years. She didn't have a temper. She seldom took offense. She forgave quickly and completely. And boy, did she wear love. I'm gonna get back to that love in a second, but um, my mom was so proud of us, I'm proud of you guys, and, um, but I was really proud of her too, in so many ways, so just a few of them I'd like to, to tell you about, the glasses, we might as well lose those, <laughs> her resilience, many moves and life changes, and some of them were pretty challenging and not at all easy. You wouldn't hear her complain or make a fuss. She just picked up and adjusted uh, with grace. Her resourcefulness. How many times did I see her take a little and make it enough? Or maybe even way more than enough. As a kid, she could take the oddest assortment of leftovers or odds and ends from the fridge and make a delicious meal. Maybe it was a soup, maybe what she called goulash. Uh, the same with her sewing skills. I remember, I, hopefully I was really young because this sounds really selfish. I really wanted a new dress one year for a Christmas program the next day. And uh, she took the little time that I'm sure she had. And I remember going to bed seen her working on my dress. Voila. The next morning, the finished product was waiting for me. No mention of how late she'd had to stay up to make that happen. Uh, she modeled being open to learning throughout her whole life. I was just talking with uh, my friend JJ about, you know, how much life changed uh, for, for her. And um, uh, she grew up long before Google and YouTube to answer all our questions and show us how to do something. She figured things out. But when computers and internet and iPads came along, uh, she embraced them too. Um, she loved being able to communicate with family and friends by email, messaging, Facebook, etc. She banked online. I only did the things that required a branch visit. She loved looking up recipes, following politics, and even self-diagnosing various, various <laughs> things and things. Some of those I had to 
you know, kind of talk her down. On it. <laughs> I was called, which is very amusing. Um, uh, if there was some glitch on her iPad, because Mark's not an Apple person. So. <laughs> Um, because she could not be without her connection to friends, family, and what was happening in, her, in the world. Uh, her humility. My mom always put people first. She downplayed her own accomplishments, and she always shone the light on others. Um, her way with people. Today, you're going to hear examples of how mom made her kids, grandkids, great grands, family and friends feel. By association, um, she loved those people that we loved. And some of you are here because you first met her through one of us. Um, and she embraced you. Um, my dear friend, Brenda, and I met in university in the early 80s. Uh, over time, our moms met and became good friends as well. I have so many happy, happy memories of Brenda and Billy coming down from Calgary and mom and I heading up from Edmonton uh, to meet up Montana's in Red Deer for a lengthy lunch. Um, I want to tell you that she didn't limit uh, that caring to only those who were close to her. Um, whether it was the staff when she moved uh, into a manual home that Kate cared for her so wonderfully. Or if I had took her to an appointment or um, she was being cared for, it didn't matter if it was the ER or whatever, uh, she always made a point of asking for and calling people by name. That really impressed me, that importance. And I'm proud of that. She showed interest in people and let them know she was thankful for their care. My mom loved deeply. We spoke pretty much every day. I'm really going to miss that. And I would hear about who had called or visited or emailed. She spoke highly of you and with such love and profound gratefulness. It gets harder. <laughs> uh, she was always uh, so proud of us kids and would comment that she had the best family ever. Uh, she felt bad for those residents who never had any family visit or who spoke of estranged relationships. <clears throat> After family gatherings, um, I'd be driving her home and she would be happy that her kids got along so well and hadn't it been such a great day. She was proud of us kids, but boy, oh boy, those grandkids, she was so proud of you. And then some of those grandkids brought her great grandkids and that took things to a whole new level. Some of my favorite photos of her are of her meeting those precious great grands and holding out her arms. Uh, to receive them. Make sure you uh, take a look at the slideshow. We will have it going again in the in the garage, but um, we also have a link to that that we can we can get you. Um, because her love and joy was people and those great grants just res radiates in, in so many of those photos. Um, we have some hymns on there. My mom loved hymns and then um, we also use the song Scars in Heaven by, by Casting Crowns. And, and for me, that's really resonated this week. Um, it's a lot of those words that, that I feel deeply. Um, I miss her, but I'm so happy her pain is done. Uh, I'm going to let others talk about how they felt her love and how she had that knack of making a person feel so amazing and special. And I hope I'm gonna be able to finish with a personal. <laughs> Let's wipe those eyes, I can read. <clears throat> I never provided her with a contender for favorite son-in-law. 
I never produced any amazing grandkids who would go on to produce any adored great grands. But in April, I got a puppy, Toby. Mom celebrated that dog. She loved him. I'd send her photos, good morning, and videos. <laughs> and she would light up. She'd ask about him and light up when I brought him. Last Sunday, we went. She was amazed at how cute he was and how smart. And she couldn't believe how much he adored me. Followed me around. She made me feel like I had the best and brightest pup. And of course, I was the best and brightest owner. <laughs> That's who she was. She, she just had that way. I'm so grateful for her. Thanks, Mom, for being such a great example of a life well lived. We, li we miss you. Oh, boy. Um, but are comforted knowing that you're living eternally with a new body, and we will joyfully joyfully be reunited one day. I love you. Thanks. Do you want to hear this? Oh, I don't know. Am I next? Oh, well, if, you, if you have it with yeah. you, you want it? I had a different order, but uh, I'll, I'll, stay up and, I'll stay up and support her too. <laughs> oh, I'm Roxanne. Uh, my dad is Errol. So I'm, uh, I'm reading a tribute from, from Leah, Uncle Lyndon's daughter. She's in the States and so not able to be here today, but it speaks from my heart as well. So this is first person from Leah. I wanted to write out a tribute to my dearest grandma coming from her dearest and most favored grandchild. <laughs> At least that's how she always made me feel every time I visited. Albeit we know that Grams had that special skill of loving each of her kids and grandkids as if each were her most favorite, her most beloved and most prized of all. We can all say we're each grandma's favorite. <laughs> she was able to remember the little details of our little lives in such a way that made you realize she didn't just hear you, but she listened. She really listened. And she didn't just listen. She cared, supported, and gave of her time. How did the best cook, the best gardener, the best quilter, the best hugger and the best cheerleader continued to be so humble all of her life. With a dismissive wave of her hand and a chuckle, we can all hear it right now. She would rebuff compliments directed towards her as if being expert level on all accounts was such a minor thing. <laughs> oh, so true. It was evident from a young age that everyone outside the family wanted to adopt her as their very own grandma. And it's easy to see why. As the gardener she was, she carefully nurtured those small seeds of graces and virtue from a young age, which made them grow to such lasting resilience and strength even in her later years. She was resplendent with the beauty of her character. She also took care to weed out bitterness, which easily takes root, and instead fertilize the gifts and graces which would most benefit her family and loved ones over the years. Her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren do indeed rise up and call her blessed. And I feel inordinately blessed to be able to share in her remarkable and grace-filled life. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Proverbs 31. I grieve deeply over her loss. It's really impossible to put into words how deeply and also the pain of not being able to grieve with family now. Yet I know that my Redeemer lives. 
and we will both meet together in heaven and revel in the eternal joys of communion with him without the pain and suffering she endured in her life. Her gain is our earthly loss until we are reunited again. Love to you all from Leah. Thank you, Leah. We miss you. Colin, I'm going to call you next. Telling Doug, I thought I'd get called up first. I wasn't in on the planning meeting, but. <laughs> yeah, so then I realized first is good. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> well, I didn't dress in a suit, but the grandkids were coming up, and I, my the two guys there in vests, and I said, "Oh, you guys are looking pretty, pretty good. You're dressed up better than me." And Kai says, "Well, you're not too bad." <laughs> Anyway, looking forward to visiting afterwards. I just want to share some of the same things that we'll talk about as we individually talk, just some thoughts and stories and memories and, and talking about stories. When, when I do stories in the smaller setting and the family setting, often uh, I think they call them short stories because they usually end with, uh, dad, we heard that one before. <laughs> So hang in there, boys. Uh, I might have some new material here. Uh, I didn't mean you, Barrett. I meant one of the other boys. <laughs> There's only one of them. Anyway, I, you know, it was, it was hard to think, like Charlene said. There's so many things we could talk about. But I just, quite quickly, I wanted to zero in on some things to try to gather my thoughts. And I, and I thought, you know, a lot of what we do, there's... Uh, there's food and friends and family. So I just thought I'd, I'd make some, some comments on, on those things. As far as food, you know, we all, all had some favorite things that, that mom, grandma prepared. And she delighted in doing that when, you know, when grandkids want her to, to make some special uh, things for them. And, and for us, we live farther away most of the time and and she'd come to visit and we'd ask for recipes. So we have many handwritten recipes and maybe some of you do too. And, and uh, those have definitely become more precious. Maybe we can could compile some of those in a book at some time. You know, I appreciate your cooking growing up, but then you become a teenager and you get picky and complain a bit. And then you go to school and eat cafeteria food. And uh, so then I came home and appreciated mom's cooking more. But there was, there was only one problem food. I remember coming home as a teenager, anxious for what nice smell might greet me. And I opened the back door. And what did I smell, brothers and sisters? <laughs> oh, good. Well, there's there's more than one <laughs> problem food. Apparently, I like liver. It was it was turnips. <laughs> oh, uh, that's one of those those scars. Those they call those <laughs> mental scars. Anyway, we got through it. The problem was that dad dad used to laugh at us gagging over turnips, and then he tried selling it to us as uh, by calling them Saskatchewan bananas. <laughs> Dad never did well in sales, <laughs> especially not turnip sales. Um, so recently I started making bone broth this year. And I, I actually, I remembered I actually sent some and I think mom tried it. It was beef bone broth. So, you know, we were doing beef this year and I was doing beef bone broth. Then I, I got a chicken not too long ago and, and uh, deboned that. And I thought, oh, I can make chicken broth. So I'm making chicken broth, and is that ever good? You know, you're getting old when you get excited about bone broth. <laughs> but, but then I remembered 
uh, when I was younger, going into the fridge and uh, seeing a, a tray, a meat tray or something, a package that, you know, I'm a kid going in looking for something good to eat. And I pulled the package out. It was chicken feet. And I said, Mom, what would you be doing with chicken feet? And I forget what she said, how she was preparing that or whatever. I didn't stick around for it. Well, now I find out that chicken feet really enhance your bone broth. So, so now I'm, I'm 65 years old and I'm, I'm starting to buy chicken feet. <laughs> but that's, those are the kind of things that, you know, the next time I would have talked to mom, I would talk about those kind of things and just enjoy that. You know, she would laugh about that and enjoy those things. And then talking about, about friends, Char and I were talking and uh, maybe mom had said to some of you at times too, that every, you know, we did some moving and so you're leaving friends behind and it's, and it's difficult. But she said, every, everywhere I moved, I always made better friends. But thinking about it this year, this, this week, pardon me, um, I, I realized she didn't realize she didn't find better friends. She, she became a better friend. So she drew those people to her. And the other thing I thought about when we, we talk to people about friendship, we say, you know, you need, if you want friends, you need to act friendly. You need to, to, to act like you care about people or act interested. Act is the wrong word. That, in as far as mom's friendship, there was no acting. She really did care. She really was interested and made people feel special. As a teenager, you know, mom had visitors and I loved listening to her visit with people. And often it was, you know, it was her older cousins uh, or, or another lady or whatever. So there I'm as a teenage boy sitting, sitting there because I liked listening to the way she interacted and you know and I asked her about this just this past year and and uh, you know I think I did a couple of times over, over time and just to see if she recalled this the same as I did and uh, I said do you remember you know I used to sit there when you were visiting she said yeah I remember and I asked if you didn't have something better to do <laughs> but she just she just enjoyed that connection and I really did learn how to interact with people from her. But so as for friends, and Charlene kind of touched on it, if you were mom's friend, you were family. And that's the way we see you. So and, and as, as far as family, you know, I, I could have figured it out, but I was asking Char, well, when did mom move to, to Edmonton? It was 1986. So that's 35 years that we had with her blessing us. And us blessing her. And she would often often ask us because we lived farther away she'd ask well when are you guys moving closer and i think it was in the first years that she was back in edmonton here so she was just enjoying it so much having family close and and she said i just feel like a mother and wanting to gather all my children And that's what she did. She drew people in, drew them together.
welcome them and love them. And Charlene mentioned too about the pictures and, and uh, it's, there are many picture, pictures that depict that. And uh, the one that had an impact on me recently was her 90th birthday. And I, I was there and Eldon and Nat came and I think she didn't know they were coming. And I think I was right there when the picture was taken. And I think there were a few because Charlene shared another one. It's a picture of mom realizing that Eldon was there and just reaching out you know, with, with that look and with outstretched hand. And as Charlene said, there's many pictures like that of her. And that's the picture I want to remember. Imagine the reasons now. Thank you. I think most of you here know me. I'm Errol. I was the second son, not the favorite son. I was the second son. But uh, uh, yeah, mom was, uh, was definitely good at uh, making every one of you feel special. Uh, we do have a um, probably a, a different uh, relationship with mom uh, since she moved back to Edmonton. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, but before I, I do begin my tribute to mom, um, many of you know the, uh, what we do here as an organization, we take care of kids. A lot of the kids that we uh, take care of are, uh, are indigenous uh, children uh, who have, uh, uh, experienced a lot of difficulty in their lives, and uh, and I want to acknowledge that today is a national uh, day for truth and reconciliation in in Canada, and uh, and we've seen a lot of that uh, pain and um, and experienced the uh, um, the difficulties that have uh, uh, come through uh, through the Indigenous peoples, and I hope that we always work towards that reconciliation. Uh, as uh, Shar read um, uh, the uh, verse from Colossians, uh, and and also if you read the verses in Galatians about uh, the fruit of the spirit, there's uh, one thing in there that I want to uh, uh, bring forward, uh, and particularly for for mom is uh, gentleness. Uh, my mom was gentle. Uh, but she was not easily taken advantage of. She was meek, but she was not weak. She would not be the one that you send in to negotiate a tough deal in a successful business, but she is the one you would send in to serve a bowl of soup to someone who's hurting. Mom was almost 60 when she moved back to Edmonton and started looking for work. She needed to have an income. She started working for us. Uh, actually, she was uh, one of the first employees, uh, besides uh, Jennifer and I, of, uh, of Renaissance. And she would be out here, uh, I don't even remember, uh, like uh, four or five days a week, uh, cooking and cleaning and, and gardening. Uh, we saw a lot of her, and we never saw her clothed in anything else except love and gentleness. She was the one, like uh, others have said, who could take a, a week of leftovers from uh, 10 children and put it together so it tasted like a feast. Um, she was not a boss, but she could take our 10 kids and have them weed the garden before noon, then shell peas half of the afternoon while watching TV. 
and she'd feed them all winter on the produce. Mom was a, a very special relationship that, that we had uh, with mom and the privilege uh, and, and some of my siblings uh, uh, also shared in, in some of that was she loved to go on holidays with us. Uh, I, I remember several of them, but particularly uh, one trip that we took uh, with the kids to Florida. We were gone for a month and we drove for a week down to Florida. She was sitting in the passenger seat with the Atlas open on her lap and, and telling us exactly which turn to take. And, and she loved every minute of it, except for that migraine she had when we got into New Orleans. That was, uh, that was uh, 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 the only time that I saw her down. And then she would ride on those Disneyland roller coasters and stand in line with her grandchildren and pretend that she enjoyed it. <laughs> and she made it look pretty real. She was never a burden on our adventures. She was never a burden on us. She was always positive and contributing in any way she could. And mom treated all the kids in our house, just like she treats all of you. They were special and she loved them and she treated them well. We have lots of memories of mom and we're gonna carry those with us in our hearts. We're gonna think of things now and then. I, I was sitting there thinking, this isn't real. Uh, you know, she's gonna come around the corner any minute now and, and, uh, and say surprise or, or something like that, but uh, she has gone on and we're extremely sad for our loss and we're gonna continue to grieve for a long time. We're gonna, we're gonna see a picture and we're gonna think of something that she did and, uh, and it, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt. But mom was looking forward to the time where she could leave that body of hers that was failing and she could go and be with her brother like she she was done with the physical aspect but she was so so smart still like i i i i could only hope that i'm i'm a quarter of that and certainly uh, uh, in things like politics, uh, I, I couldn't carry a conversation on with her. Um, but yeah, we're, we're sad for our loss, but we're happy for mom's gain. And she's, she's in the presence of the Lord who clothed her with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. This is her legacy. That's our legacy because she's touched all of us. Thank you. Uh, the mic is open for anybody that wants to go up there and cry like the rest of us. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, if you'd like to, uh, maybe just come line up on the side. Uh, I'll pick out a few of you go and get something ready. I was up quite early this morning. Thought I better put together some notes and read because otherwise I may not get through some things. I grew up as the younger brother of Doris. And when you're 84, you can say you are younger than someone. That's quite something to be able to say. As I was growing up as part of a busy family farming family of nine kids. My sister Doris very much played the role of mother 
to us younger three siblings. Doris was the first one in our family to finish high school. She then was a strong influence in determining that the three of us younger ones would finish high school. When I was in Cairnport High School, Doris was just starting a young family in nearby Moose Jaw. I remember many visits there on weekends and the fresh baked cinnamon rolls and cookies. I also remember her ability to draw out and keep track of how my life was going. She was always the encourager. Many times I think back to her early role of mothering in my life as a child. Many times I saw her kids as siblings, not as nieces and nephews who would call me Uncle Don. The Domes and Barron families were interrelated many times over with several domes barren couplings. So when I married Darlene Barron, that connection to Doris became much closer. Recently, I received a phone call from her old friend and cousin by marriage, Helen. Helen recalled many stories of their friendship and bond as cousins and best friends. She recalled one very difficult day when a combine broke down during harvest time and she was sent to get a new part from nearby Melville. When she got home late that evening, Doris had arrived earlier and had supper on the table for all of them. Small and thoughtful things that Doris was sensitive to endeared her to so many. Helen had many stories of their common interests and shared difficult life experiences. She told of a time when the two of them drove down to the United States to buy towels and linens for family and friends. And when they returned to the Canadian border, the guard was quite impressed by their detailed listing and how, they told, and how they told him that they were significantly over the $200 limit. His response was that, given that you two ladies were so honest about being over your limit and that most of this stuff is for other people, you are free to go. This was my sister Doris, honest to a fault. I will miss her. My name is Glenn Johnson, and my wife is Leela, and we've had the privilege of knowing the Domus family for many, many years. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, I can remember when Diane was a, um, a, a toddler, and, and that goes back a year or two, Diane. And <clears throat> it's been always a privilege to, to know this family, just a remarkable family. We've been so impressed with them over the years. A verse of scripture that comes to me when I think of Doris is, whatsoever thy hand find us to do, do with all thy might. And Doris did that. She believed firmly in, uh, in that and uh, lived it out. <clears throat> she, uh, we, we talked about upholstering. Uh, she did some upholstering for us. It was a real fine job, but the, the upholstering stood up and we still have those, those chairs she upholstered. The, the material is starting to wear a bit, but she didn't make the material. And, <laughs> and, uh, and whenever you were invited for, for a meal, as we've been, has been mentioned before, it was, it was a treat. You never for, forgot the food, it was just delicious. I can imagine Doris today, probably right now, uh, uh, teaching some of those angels how to make uh, apple strudel. <laughs> and, and you had to roll the crust in and, 
and then you had to throw it up in the air. And <laughs> I, I never got the full significance of that, but <clears throat> the uh, results in the, in the food was so delicious that it, it had to work. <clears throat> and the method was worth it. Yes, we have a lot of fine memories of Doris. She uh, was a prime example of a, of a mother and a leader. She has six uh, great uh, examples today that have carried out uh, her teaching and, and uh, we just appreciate that. The Lord bless all of you, amen. Teenage boys, what matters to them? Let me see. Motorcycles, hockey, good food. From age 14 to, uh, I'd say 22, I got to hang out with the three older siblings um, many times on the weekend, along with Keith Sawatsky. We were rabble rousers. Uh, a gang on motorcycles, uh, pretty, pretty close to it. Got in trouble once in a while, but many times we were fed at their house and the food was something we remembered. Um, Grandma Domes, and she was always in the background and she always felt comforted around her. And again, I just, uh, as we got to know I got married and uh, as Val became good friends with Charlene, we got to see her more and more often as well. So we just uh, so much appreciated her friendship and support. And yes, she, she adopted many in her, in her own mind. Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, Larry Swayze. Uh, I was brought into this family through marriage to Diane, and Doris's youngest daughter. Uh, this this is by way of my son Eric. That's a tribute. In 1992, when Eric was in grade four, Diane started working and was not able to be home for lunches. Uh, that's uh, by way of what he has to say. So this is Eric's memory. One of my fondest memories of grandma is the time I spent over at her house during elementary school for lunches and after school, enjoying good food and watching Teddy Ruxpin on TV. <laughs> This is mine. I first met Doris in 1979, and by the end of that year, she became my mother-in-law. In the early 80s, she was living in Salmon Arm, BC, and Diane and I were down there for a visit. To me, my relationship to Doris at that time was very one-sided when it came to conversation. She was so quiet, I could not seem to get her to speak to me about pretty much anything. The turning point happened one day in her kitchen in Salmon Arm when she looked at me and said, Jakai, Jakai. I returned, wait, wait, for what? With a quizzical look, she stated with more emphatically, Jakai, Jakai shaking her finger. I stated, wait, wait, for what? Still a quizzical look. I said, Chikai means wait in Ukrainian. You're asking me to wait. What am I waiting for? Oh, she laughed. <laughs> I asked, what did you think Chikai meant? Bad, naughty. Mischievous. This time I laughed. 
Where did you get that idea? From the neighbors. When my neighbor Ann came flying out of the house chasing kids shouting, Chikai, Chikai, Chikai. <laughs> I laughed at that. And it had always been a favorite memory and an ongoing joke with mom. For me, this was a turning point in our relationship. And she blessed me and my family with many wonderful outings and time around the dinner table as well. Bye. My name is Carol Sarnicki and I met grandma when I started working for Jennifer and Errol and I took her job as far as she was concerned I took her job and I said no I didn't take your job you gave me your job <laughs> and um, yeah she taught me a lot and um, we've had some really good times uh, she came traveling with us and uh, I think she, I think that was right after she turned 70 right and we went on our very first road trip in Jennifer's Bonneville <laughs> we almost got killed by a sod truck and uh, we got our ears pierced and that was kind of fun I think that was that trip and uh, um, oh I had everything in my head and now it's gone but uh, um, one, one thing we, we used to go up to the cabin quilting and I think Char was here that that one time that grandma was up there with us and we wa we had quilted all day and then we watched a movie and it was getting a little late like 11 o'clock maybe 11 30 you know and uh, grandma gets up and she goes into the, she says I'm going into the washroom now and when I come out it better be bedtime <laughs> so I came back to work the next it's Monday or whatever. And I told Errol this story about grandma with her finger, you better be, and he gets, and I thought it was really funny. So I was kind of, you know, telling a joke and stuff. She says, oh no, I remember that finger very well. <laughs> I think it was this one. <laughs> no. She didn't know it had a different well, I only saw that finger. <laughs> okay, okay. Speaking of the maybe the little off color to grandma, the one time that I, I was telling, <laughs> and I don't know what we were talking about. We must have been talking about babies or whatever. And she says, you know, that first baby can come anytime, but all the rest take nine months. <laughs> and that's one thing that I'll always remember about grandma. And then uh, I wanted Jenna or Leanne to come up and tell this story, but she wouldn't. Grandma used to, Grandma opened up her door to us every Monday evening. We would go as a quilting group, maybe three or four people would get together at Grandma's and she would feed us. And uh, then we would quilt. And um, of course, uh, she had uh, the lettuce out of her garden, right? And uh, Jen, um, she had cleaned it, you know, it was. And, anyways, our friend Leanne, who slugs is one of the things that like like really grosses her out as a slug right so I'm watching Leanne and she's kind of fingering her lettuce around a little bit you know and trying not to you know and I, <laughs> she had a slug on her plate <laughs> so when grandma found when grandma actually saw it she says oh you're the one who found it <laughs> so that was pretty funny too <laughs> So yeah, I had a lot of good times with Grandma. I, she came up with me uh, to our uh, cross-stitch weekend up at Barkerville. And uh, we got a flat tire that one time going into uh, Grand Prince. Just, we were just outside Prince George. And uh, so I said, Grandma, get the book out of the, out of the lice, out of the glove box and stand, you know, where I'm gonna lift up the trunk, you know, and pretend I'm getting the, the whatever, all the stuff you need to change a tire. And here's grandma out there with her little book, you know, looking like we have to figure out how to do this. So, and of course, like five minutes later, a fellow, nice fellow stopped and changed her tire for us. <laughs> it was all a scam, but it worked, it worked. So yeah, it was, that was, 
I used her, of course, yeah. But yeah, she taught me a lot of cooking and um, yeah, we had a good time. I'm Jennifer. I am, she was the best mother-in-law ever. She was my mom. And um, I was young when I got married, didn't know very much, thought I did. And, um, and then Errol and I started to have a lot of kids. And um, that woman taught me about life and what it meant to be a servant. I don't come anywhere near what she was. But for all the years that she spent in our home, I was privileged to watch her. And um, she helped me raise my kids. She never interfered. There was only once I remember that I was in a confrontation with a child and she walked by and she said, don't give in. <laughs> she just kept on going. <laughs> but she was just a support. And, and when I think of her, I think of her as the most beautiful servant that God ever gave this earth that I was able to experience living with her. And um, I just want to say thank you to her and um, for all the things she taught me and, um, and how she showed just love to everyone, the kids, the kids we took care of. Um, she was just the most beautiful person. And we're all gonna really miss her. Hi, my name is Faith Milbrandt Bella, and um, Aunt Doris was uh, one of my favorite aunts, and I was her absolute favorite niece, <laughs> since everybody's a favorite here. Um, I am the daughter of Darlene, which was uh, mom's, um, Aunt Doris was mom's older sister, and so she gave me uh, just a quick write-up of some memories of her sister, and I'm just going to read that to you. Um, Mom wrote here that she got to know Doris really well when the family stayed with us for six weeks on the farm. And uh, that was really a wonderful time to have the kids. Uh, six kids moved in with us. Uh, there was only Bev and I at that time. So uh, when six kids moved in and at Doris, for those six weeks and uh, the three oldest, um, Lyndon and Colin and Errol uh, actually went to school with us for those six weeks. So it was a wonderful time uh, and a really uh, a good memory. And, um, and mom and Aunt Doris, uh, they spent their time uh, just sewing up a storm. They were, they were sewing up uh, clothes and, and uh, that's one thing that they, they uh, seemed to uh, enjoy doing together. Um, Mom wrote that Doris introduced her to piece quilting and, uh, and Mom's made many, many quilts since then. It seemed like once she got introduced to uh, a new craft, my mom just took off with it. And uh, uh, now she's living an independent living and she's still making quilts. She tells me that she's on her last quilt, um, but then there's always some scraps. So then we always have to add, add more to that. So it's ongoing. She told me uh, not long ago that, that uh, she was gonna go to table runners now. So she's gonna change it up a bit. Uh, Doris also got me started on Hardinger embroidery, resulting in a lot of table runners and tablecloths and other pieces. Um, those are the things that uh, a big sister teaches her, her younger sister, and my mom really uh, embraced all of that. Um, mom wrote, I will always be grateful for the many lessons I learned from her 
but the sewing, be it the sewing, quilting, harding, or cooking, and baking. Um, and Doris was, like many of you have said, that she was uh, someone that just inspired you and encouraged you if you were uh, wanting to take on something new. And uh, I know Mum and Aunt Doris got along very well when they were doing some kind of crafting or when they were uh, making something together. They're both very good cooks. Uh, Mum wrote that she uh, was a very quiet and loving lady and she's gonna miss her a lot. Unfortunately, mom couldn't be here because she couldn't travel um, today, but she's certainly here uh, with all of you in spirit. And she says, goodbye, Doris, and rest in peace. Love your sister, Darlene. I'm Laurel. Um, I belong to Larry and Diane, usually. Um, what I remember most about Gramsies, besides her fantastic hugs, um, would be that we would sit there and she would make lovely soup. One soup she made was beet borscht. I am not a fan of beets. And every time we'd make it, she would let me add as much sour cream as I wanted. So really what happened was I would have sour cream soup with like the smallest amount of beets you can put in. And my parents would give me the look like, just eat the soup. And grandma was just, eat it however you want. You can have it that way. So I liked going to grandma's because she was always very kind about people's, um, just how they were and what they wanted. And she would know what you wanted before you said you wanted it. And uh, I will always remember that about her. He asked me that because he's a little bit worried. Not always the briefest of people. <laughs> but I'll try to be brief. I actually. I drew, I drew the picture down there because I wasn't going to say something. I thought that the picture was a way to say some of the things that grandma meant to me and to us. Um, if you look closely at the picture, you'll see um, the background is just a whole bunch of little squares or whatever. And in, in my mind, as, as I look out um, at all the people here and all the people who aren't here who are connected with grandma, um, those are all the pieces of her life, the way that she touched all of us in, in, in a lot of ways. And uh, much has been made about the way that uh, grandma always could make you feel like the only person in the world when she had her hands like this and she was looking at you and, oh, Byron, right? <laughs> because she just loved you so hard. And in a lot of ways, actually, I was thinking about it. Uh, and I remember at, at grandpa's funeral, I remember saying something to the effect, like I, the, one of the legacies grandpa gave us is a sense of wonder at, at the creation and the way that things worked in the world. And I think when I think about grandma and her legacy, it's so hard to put it, but it's, it's almost as like, as though she would invite you to let her love you. <laughs> she had, uh, you know, the, the definition of grace, the biblical definition of grace is, is um, unmerited favor. And that she had so much of that. And it was just waiting for the next person to cross in front of her. And among that legacy, I see that in, um, in her kids, my aunts and uncles, uh, my parents, um, and Auntie Shar, the way that she loves she gave you that. <laughs> so anyway, I just, another legacy that grandma, I see that, that she left is, uh, I'm so fascinated and I see this as a heritage with her kids and grandkids also is 
her attention to detail and her meticulous ability to draw beauty out of this, the finest crafting of things. And that's another reason why I drew a picture because I felt like that's partially from her because she had such, like she just, I don't know, I, I guess I just said it. Her attention to detail, but, but that connected with the beauty of things and, and the ability to use her hands and her mind and her heart to create was just so special. And I think that she's given all, all of us, because I've heard the stories, uh, pieces of that. So yeah, I mean, God's lucky he's got her and uh, we'll see you again, Grandma. After listening today, I feel I know Doris much better than I did an hour ago. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs that the, uh, the kindness of a person makes them desirable. And um, this, this woman was a lovely person. And you know, as I was looking at... Uh, some of the things that she had crafted and made, um, I was just kind of overwhelmed with her skill. Um, this is just breathtaking to look at some of this stuff. And as I was looking at this stuff, I, I saw a picture over here of Doris with a little dog, Toby, <laughs> right? Well, you know, Linda and I wanted to be part of the Dolmans family so much <laughs> that we bought Toby's brother. So Finley and Toby have puppy play dates. I think your mom met Finley, right? Yeah. So Linda and I are part of the family. What a privilege to be here today. You know, I think about the fact that in, Pro in Psalm 116, it, it, it says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Um, and God does cherish the moment that a person that Jesus died for and received him um, enters into heaven. It's a precious moment. And uh, today is a, an awesome day, an awesome time. This woman that brought six children into the world, um, 16 grandchildren, right? Are all of those real grandchildren or are some of those wannabes? I, I'm not sure. But it seems like everybody wanted to be one to call her grandma, right? Well, you know, she, she showed that she had an open home. Um, the Bible commands us to live out a life of hospitality, and she really did. She um, embraced an open home. In fact, there's three things that I just want to leave with today. The first one was that she was a person with an open home. She moved a lot. Uh, but wherever she moved, her home was open to people. She had good friends. She made many friends as she moved around the country. But, you know, a lot of that was because she was friendly. A person who has friends must show themselves to be friendly. And so she was friendly towards people. She had good friends. Wherever she went, she made new friends. But wherever she lived, her home was open and full of hospitality. Um, I hear that she made a mean pot of soup. Um, anytime there's somebody who would be coming over, they knew that they had had something to eat that they would really like. And she would receive you into her home and, and even into her kitchen with a smile. Um, she had an open home. She loved to cook for people and sew for people. Um, she was a good mentor and she was willing to share her skills and her knowledge with others. Uh, she worked hard. She had six kids. She had to work hard. But you know, the Bible, in the words of Jesus, he said, the greatest among you will be your servant. We're talking about in the ultimate service, a servant here um, in human form. Um, Jesus was the ultimate one. But boy, she really patterned her life after Jesus. She was a servant. And I can see why so many wanted to call her grandma. She had an open home. She had a resilient life as well. She moved to a farm 
The family told me about this the other day, the farm where they had no indoor plumbing and no phone. It was quite a, a life, but she had a resilient life. She made it work. And uh, she reminds me of what Paul wrote about as he spoke of himself in Philippians chapter four. He says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I, I love, I love the way that she had a resilient life. And being resilient, she would make the most of every moment. She was a gardener. She would can things. She would, uh, she would make jam. And she loved to share the produce of her garden with others. But, you know, she also loved the master gardener, Jesus Christ, who said, I am the vine and you are the branches. She made a point of keeping close to Jesus, the master gardener. And by abiding in him, she could bear wonderful spiritual fruit like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. She was a beekeeper. She raised chickens and everything she did, she just did it with gratitude, you know, even when she had to work. I will praise the Lord deep down inside me. I will praise him. I will praise him because his name is holy. I will praise the Lord. I won't forget anything he does for me. Psalm 103. That was Doris. But finally, she had a loving heart. A loving heart, not just a resilient life, not an open home only, but she had a loving heart. She loved to celebrate the lives of others, especially grandkids. She had the tongue of a disciple that she could uplift the weary one with a word. And after listening to what people have said today, you know, it really seemed like she took the advice of this one Christian leader who said every person that he met, he would take the first 30 seconds and he would add value to their life. That was really her. She would add value to the lives of the person that she was talking to. Probably the most important person to her in her life at that moment was the person standing in front of her. She lived an Ephesian 429 life. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who hear. She moved a lot, and as I wind down this brief message, I just want to mention this. She moved a lot, and Jesus knew what it was, was to move. He made the greatest move from heaven to a broken world. He had no place to lay his head. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know, he understood Doris's life. And he knew that her life on this earth, even though it was 93 years, it would be just like a vapor, is short. Eternity is long, life is short. And she knew that her life was coming to a close. She longed to have that permanent home in heaven. We all long to have a place to call home forever. And God offers us that place. One author has said that we were made for a person, that's Jesus, and we were made for a place, and that place is called heaven. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. For those who know Jesus, death is not an eerie journey to an unknown destination. Believers are assured that there is a place that Jesus referred to as my father's house, there would be a room for them in that house. 
The Greek word for rooms means to abide or to remain and refers to something not temporary, but permanent. Our place here is not permanent and we're headed to a place that is everlasting. When Jesus said that there are many rooms in his father's house and he's going there to pre prepare a place for us, he's, he's drawing on a very familiar image. In those days, it was customary for travelers to send someone ahead to find lodging and to make arrangements in a distant city that they were traveling to. You couldn't use Siri and you couldn't use Google Maps, but you could send somebody ahead to make those preparations. Well, Jesus said, I'll be that one. I'll be that one. He has gone before us to prepare a place for us in heaven. All the arrangements have been made for those who have put their full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Oh boy, what a day. I just want to invite you. There are some kids here. And there's people of all ages here, but maybe there is one person who would say, I'm not quite sure if I'd be joining grandma in heaven. But you know, what a better day than this. I mean, is there a better day than this to make sure to take that step today and just open your heart and say, Jesus, I may not know a lot about you, but from what I know, you came to be my savior and I'm gonna embrace you today because I can't make it on my own. I need a savior. Would you embrace him? Just tell him in your heart that you're opening it to him. Tell him to come in and take over. Mm. It's interesting that Jesus has prepared a room for us, a room for him even though, or a room for us, even though there was no room for him when he was born on earth. Despite the fact that he is rejected by our world, Jesus invites us into his. And Jesus said that there's a place for those who believe in him. In fact, he left in order to get some rooms ready for those who would trust and love him. We're all searching for a home. And part of our problem is that most of us are too tied to this place in this world. We often feel that this place is the land of the living. And that when we die, we pass into the land of the dead. Nothing could be further from the truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said in John 5, 24, the one who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. But we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Right now, Grandma Doris is no longer walking by faith. She's walking by sight. One day we hope to join her. But in the meantime, we're reminded that Doris took her gift of life from God and endeavored to please him by practicing an open home, a resilient life, and a loving heart. How might we learn from her life today? And how might we finish well in the race that God has us on in this life one day to join him and Doris in heaven? Well, God bless you. It's been a very special day. There's been so many things said of her. Um, I just, uh, this is a day that I will never forget. Neither will you. We're going to close our service, our time together now. And I just want to take a moment to pray with you. And then we're going to invite Errol to come. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what comes next. We do have a lunch. There are memorabilia um, and some slide memories in the garage here. 
you're welcome to take a step in there when we're finished here. Um, but before Errol comes, let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that we've been able to remember a life well lived. Um, it's been a delightful day in a delightful environment. We're just reminded that you have opened your hand and you have, you have satisfied the desire of every living thing. And, and we are so, so blessed to be able to look up and say, God, you are our God. We love you. We thank you for Doris, for her life, and for her whole family and the friends who are here. And as we close our time, we just want to invite the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all human understanding. May that peace guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Errol, will you come? Because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to
Okay, uh, there is going to be a luncheon. Uh, so a couple things around that. Uh, we're gonna ask you if you're gonna partake. We've got some ladies uh, uh, have put the stuff out. You'll go around the house to the front door, go in the front door and uh, and then you'll come through there and they'll direct you and, and grab food there and come out this way. Uh, there's uh, going to be drinks here, pop and juice and water, and there's going to be coffee out. I know some of you are shaking because you need a coffee. <laughs> oh, there it is. Good timing, Brenda. And, uh, and, and ask. Um, there is hand sanitizer in a lot of places. Uh, for those people who are uh, watching on Zoom, wave. Okay, they haven't had an opportunity to, to see all of you yet. There's some people way at the back there. Okay, and all the way over this way. All right, uh, thank you so much for all of you for coming. And uh, Dan, you were gonna be, you've already said everything that you're gonna say. All right. Thank you again. Oh, oh yeah, there's some things out there. Okay, don't uh, don't forget to watch the uh, slide presentation. Look at some of the photo albums and stuff in there. Don't take any of that home. You do not have permission unless you talk to Diane or Charlene. They know what's going on. Uh, there are a bunch of things on the front deck that um, are things left over from moms that. Uh, uh, people are able to take. Is there, uh, there's no restrictions on that. These were all the favorites. You can all choose. Yes. yes, all of you take something. Uh, if you see something that strikes you that would uh, you'd like to have. Uh, and uh, we'll go about it uh, that way. Okay. Thank you very much to our pastor, Pastor Tyler Hansen for helping with uh, set up the Zoom and uh, and the speakers and and everything like that. And I can't possibly think of everybody else that helped, but thank you uh, for making this a, a special day for us as a family and to remember mom. Thank you.